Yoram Chazoni, and this is NatCon Talk, where nationalism and conservatism meet. Today I'll be speaking to Rod Dreher, senior editor at the American Conservative Magazine. He is the author of The Benedict Option, and he has a new book out, Live Not By Lies, a manual for Christian dissidents. Rod Dreher, welcome to NatCon Talk. It's great to be here, Yoram. Rod, I'm real excited to have you, and I've been thinking about, you know, it's been about 10 years, I think, since we first met at some kind of a uh, Templeton retreat at Oxford or something like that. And uh, I, I think I heard from you one of the uh, most moving stories that I've ever heard. Uh, for somebody just, just tell me about their lives, um, telling about yourself as a journalist and uh, and uh, how you left Catholicism and uh, and joined the uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church. I, I think it'd be real interesting for people to to hear a bit of that. Yeah. Well, thanks for the question. Uh, religion is the most important thing in my life. It has been for almost all my adult life. But I wasn't raised particularly religious. My family was Protestant. We were Methodist, but we went to church on Easter and Christmas, the holidays, and. Uh, and so religion wasn't really that important to me. But when I became a, when I entered college, I had a religious conversion or the beginnings of a religious conversion that culminated uh, at the age of 25 uh, with me being received into the Catholic Church in, at St. Matthew's Cathedral in Washington, D.C. And my conversion was profound, Joram. I, um, I really, really believed all of it. And I, but I was also, I can see now looking back on it, I was working at the Washington Times as a journalist then, and I was really excited to become part of a tribe of intellectual conservative Catholics. Father Newhouse was our captain, you know, and, and I was very political in my Catholicism, not just in terms of secular politics, but also in terms of church politics. I believe that the, the job we had as Catholics was to sort out who the good bishops were from the bad bishops, support the good ones, oppose the bad ones and so on. Uh, now that sounds really superficial, but I have to say that there was real piety involved on my side. And then later I was in New York working at the New York Post in the summer of 2001 when I began to write about the abuse scandal, the sex abuse, pre-sex abuse scandal. Now it hadn't broken big nationally yet. That would come in Boston at the beginning of 2002. So it was a local story for me in New York. And I can remember talking in an interview I did with a really brave Catholic priest who sacrificed his ecclesial career to speak out for victims, Father Tom Doyle. After the end of our interview, Father Doyle said, look, Rod, I can tell that you're a serious Catholic, and I want to warn you that if you continue on this path of investigation, you are going to go to places darker than you can imagine. Wow. And I said to him, well... Thank you for that. But, you know, as a journalist, as a Catholic and as a new father, because my wife and I just had our firstborn, I feel that I have no choice. He said, well, I want to help you there. I want to support you. I'm just warning you. That's going to be tough. Norm, I had no idea what I was getting into. It was it was the abyss. Uh, I'm I'm not a naive person. I knew that there would be evil in the church. But uh, I always thought that if I had my the syllogisms in my head, the arguments for why Catholicism is true, that my faith would be able to withstand anything. But in fact, that wasn't the case. For four years, I just, it, it was like a journey through hell, and I don't use that in any sort of exaggerated sense, to find out what men, including men in, in the church, are capable of. And it wasn't even the, the abusing priests that were the worst. It was bishops who are not abusers, but who allowed it to happen and lied just constantly lied about it. Cardinal McCarrick, the disgraced uh, prelate who was kicked out two years ago, he was defrocked by Pope Francis. He called up my boss at National Review in 2002. He had a lawyer call him up and say, look, we know Rod Dreher is going to write something bad about me because I had the goods on McCarrick on his abuse. And we want to get him to uh, want to get you to kill the story. Well, to his very great credit, my boss, Rich Lowry, did not kill the story. But uh, I was unable to write it because I wasn't able to get people on the record or get documents. Nevertheless, I had to watch McCarrick go on national TV and talk about how heartbroken he was over the abuse scandal, et cetera, et cetera, knowing what a fraud he was. Eventually, it got to the point where I woke up one day in Dallas. We were living in Texas by 2005, and a priest who was getting close to our family, a local priest, 
I found out by mistake that he was not who he said he was. He had actually been suspended by his bishop up in the Northeast and was presenting himself under false pretenses. Now, my wife and I thought, you can't fool us. You know, we can see these bad guys coming from a mile away. And uh, we were wrong. Something shattered in us. We were no longer able to believe in Catholicism. Uh, we ended up going to an Orthodox cathedral, Eastern Orthodox there in Dallas, with no intention of converting, but for different theological reasons, the Orthodox Church was the only one available to us. And we just went so we could worship without this heavy cloud of anger and fear hanging over us. And eventually we decided that we wanted to be Orthodox and we converted. But I'll tell you, Yoram, I was a very different, and I hope I have been a very different kind of Orthodox Christian than I was Catholic. This is something that's on me, not the Catholic Church. When I became Catholic, as I mentioned earlier, I was so excited to be on part of the intellectual A-team of American Christianity. And I can remember even being in Jerusalem. The only time I've been to Jerusalem, it was when Pope John Paul II traveled over there. The New York Post sent me to cover it. I was in the courtyard of the Latin Patriarchate in Jerusalem, waiting for John Paul to come in from Bethlehem. And I saw on the other side of the courtyard an American cardinal. And I said, oh, that's one of the good ones, a good conservative cardinal. I ran over there, knelt down to kiss his ring. Now, that's not even done in America, really, kissing a cardinal's ring. There's nothing wrong with it. But I wanted to show this good conservative cardinal that I was not like those liberal Catholics who would be embarrassed to kiss a cardinal's ring. This cardinal was Bernard Law of Boston, who later turned out to be one of the great arch villains of the scandal. I had, I've had to repent of the humiliation of my intellectual and spiritual arrogance and all that. And as an Orthodox Christian, I have had to be try to humble myself and to realize that it's, the intellect is important in the spiritual life, in the religious life, but it's not as important as the heart. Uh, if the intellect is converted, your conversion is only precarious if your heart is also not converted. So I have tried very hard to not to allow myself to get caught up in church politics and religious politics as I had before, and to instead try to focus on fasting, on prayer, and on more uh, ordinary piety uh, as a guard against the, the temptations that I succumbed to as a younger man. And since then, uh, you know, you, you, you're describing a, a turning inward and a re repentance. Uh, but it it has come simultaneously with uh, you know quite a, quite a bit of uh, success. I mean, it's it's since then uh, that you've really become you've flowered uh, and become to an extent. I mean, certainly one of the best known uh, Christian voices in in America today with your 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 uh, columns at uh, the American Conservative Magazine. And uh, and these these uh, best selling books, which we're we're going to get to in 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 a couple of minutes, is is there a connection? Do you do do you, do you feel there's a a connection between that humility and that success? You know, I hadn't thought of it that way. If it is, then it's all by the grace of God and only by His gifts uh, through me. I've had to learn, uh, when I look back over the books I've written, the first one I wrote uh, after all this happened, it's called The Little Way of Ruthie Lemming. It was a memoir that came out in 2013 about the life and death of my younger sister. I had gone out into the world and had a really successful life as a journalist and lived in all these cities, traveled a lot. My younger sister, on the other hand, stayed there in our little village on the Mississippi River and uh, cultivated her roots, the roots that we both had there, married her high school sweetheart, raised kids in a house across the street from my mom and dad. But she uh, she was struck down by cancer at the age of 42, lung cancer, even though she had never smoked. And I, my wife and I were living in Philadelphia then and watching from a distance how she handled that suffering and how the whole community was there to carry her and her three kids and her husband and my mom and dad through this trial really made an impression on me on the, the value of community when you suffer. We moved back to Louisiana. And then when I got back, I deep family secrets came out that they had all resented me for leaving home in the first place. And uh, so th this was a, the dropping of an illusion that I had always lived with. And that was hard too. I wrote a book called How Dante Can Save Your Life about how I just stumbled into reading the Divine Comedy when I was going through a lot of physical and spiritual suffering, having discovered this about my family. 
And uh, I hadn't really thought about it until very recently, but the experience of suffering, the experience of knowing that you can't plan for, you, you can't, you can't build walls high enough to protect you from the experience of suffering. My sister had done everything our family, our, the code of my family said was right. You know, she had stayed home. She had kept her kids in the church we were raised in and on and on and on. And yet she died. I, the son who did everything wrong, I left home. I had in fact gone into the world and prospered and I lived though she was, though she was dead. But having to deal with these sort of things really uh, did humble me. And w I was not ready for it. I would not have been ready for it when I was a younger man and a fresh convert to Catholicism, a man in his 20s and 30s, because I thought that if you just put the right intellectual framework around the messiness of life, things would work out. Not true. So maybe knowing that maybe the experience, Yoram, of having lost my Catholic faith or having it taken out of me, because it felt like having like your nails right. pulled out. There's nothing more painful than that for me, not even burying my sister and later burying my father. It was as painful as that. Maybe that taught, gave me more flexibility and a greater focus on mercy instead of justice. Well, these, these books, um, the, the first, uh, the, the, the best-selling uh, Benedict option that you know, probably most most people uh, know at this point, and uh, and your 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 new book, "Live Not by Lies: A Manual for Christian Dissidents." Uh, th th these books really are about the quest for community. I, I have to tell you that re reading them, you actually sound not not uh, not a little bit like my father when I was when I was growing up, because my my father always talked about uh, about America in terms of its moral fiber, and he was deeply concerned. I mean, he would he he would say often, you know, this is this is like this is like the fall of the Roman Empire. And what he meant by that was that there was this thing called moral fiber, which causes people to be willing to uh, sacri sacrifice themselves or to endure suffering, as you say, for the sake of their communities. And and this was thirty five years ago, and he was telling me that it's that it that it's evaporating now when y you look at america today you talk in very harsh terms you you speak about decadence you uh, in the new book you talk about uh, uh, america as uh, as a pre-totalitarian society uh, i'm sure that a lot of our viewers are people who aren't a hundred percent yet on board with with that, I mean, you're you're pushing pushing the envelope. I actually think that what you're saying is is true, but can you lay out, you know, what what do you what do you see when you talk about decadence? What do you mm. see when you talk about a pre-totalitarian condition in America today? Well, in the Benedict Option, uh, that is a book in which I compare life in the West today, not just America, but in Western Europe, Canada, North America, the former lands of Christendom, you might say. I, I say that it is much like the late Roman Empire, you know, just like your father said. And um, in that sense, uh, we need to look to St. Benedict of Nursia, who was a holy man who went down to the city of Rome in, not long after the, the fall. And as a Christian, he said, I, I can't live here. I, I will lose my faith. It's so decadent. And he went out to the woods to pray and to fast and to figure out what he was going to do. And he came out of there and started new communities, monastic communities that over the next several hundred years spread throughout Western Europe and laid a ground, the groundwork for the rebirth of civilization. And they, in many ways, preserved the, the learning of Greece and Rome throughout the so-called Dark Ages. And what I say is that we're in a similar situation in the, in contemporary, the contemporary West because we have forgotten God. We have forgotten that there is a such thing as transcendence and that we need to live by it and live by the, the, the laws that God has, has given us. It sounds very crude to put it that way, but Philip Reith, uh, he's somebody I quote in, in Benedict Option, secular Jew, wrote in 1966 that the West has moved from a culture uh, in which it, it understood itself by transcendent truths in the Bible, Judeo-Christian truths, to a culture that understands itself rather through by a therapeutic model. That is to say, 
it understands what is good and what is bad, not by on the basis of some transcendent standards, but by how it makes us feel. And uh, Reef said that in his book, The Triumph of the Therapeutic in 1966, he said that this revolution in the West is more profound even than the Bolshevik revolution, which at least as, as wrongheaded as the Bolshevik revolution was, it at least held out objective standards by which to judge right and wrong progress and regress. Well, I, we have come to live out Reef's prophecy about where America was going. And I think now when you, you see everywhere the collapse of religious faith, you see the collapse of any kind of traditional morality, and worse, you see the collapse of any standard by which we can measure decline and fall. And I, I, in Benedict Option, I write about what Christians can do to resist that uh, by building smaller communities of really committed believers, much like, as I say in the book, Orthodox, modern Orthodox Jews do. In Live Not By Lies, though, this is sort of a, an extension of the argument and a, a a clarification of it, if you will, to say that we're not only post-Christian and um, you know, post-transcendent, uh, we're an atheist society, but rather we're also a pre-totalitarian society. What do I mean by that? Hannah Arendt in her great 1951 book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, went back to examine after the Second World War, why it was that Germany and Russia had fallen to totalitarianism. She looked at what was happening in those societies that made them susceptible to what the Bolsheviks and the Nazis had to offer. She writes about certain facets of those societies that made them uh, open to it, including mass loneliness. She said mass loneliness and atomization was by far the most important factor that made people open up to totalitarianism. But this is something we have everywhere. If you look at social science research, I mean, we're off the charts in terms of the collapse of social trust, in terms of loneliness, in terms of people losing a sense of purpose. Arendt also talked about the uh, triumph of ideology, people wanting to believe things that even though they knew it, they weren't true, just for the sake of, uh, of, of conforming to an ideological uh, program they wanted to be true, the desire to transgress just for the sake of transgressing. There were several other things too she talked about. These are all very present in our own society today. And we're, we seem to be sleepwalking right through, thinking that somehow we're going to avoid falling into a very deep pit. Solzhenitsyn warned, he said that, don't ever think that what happened here in Russia can't happen in anywhere in the world. And I think we're coming to something very close to that in our own society. And the premise of, of your new book, Live Not By Lies, is, uh, it, it really begins with your um, taking us kind of on a tour of uh, people who used to, who grew up in the Eastern Bloc countries in, in Russia, Poland, Hungary, uh, Romania. And uh, what you discover is that, uh, that whether they're, that, that emigres from those countries, people who lived under communism, that when you ask them, do you feel like it's coming here? Do you feel like this is this is like the coming of totalitarianism? They all, they all say yes, which I, I I'm sure that's going to be a little bit hard for for some people to believe. Can can you make make that concrete for us? Sure. Yeah, it was hard for me to believe when I first heard it. I uh, what happened was back in 2015, as we were leading up to the Supreme Court's Obergefell decision on LGBT marriage rights. The state of Indiana, uh, a conservative state in the U.S., passed a state version of the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which only would have given people sued in court for discrimination. It would have given them at least a positive defense in the law. It wouldn't have guaranteed that they would win, but they could claim that they were following their religion and it might give them a chance to win. Uncontroversial when it passed in 1993 at the federal level. So the state was trying to do that at the state level. Suddenly, as soon as the governor, Mike Pence, uh, signed it into law, the, all the multinational companies came down on the state of Indiana like a ton of bricks, said, this is a bigot law. We're going to um, crush you economically if you don't repeal it. There was a little restaurant called Memories Pizza in a small town in northwest Indiana run by an evangelical family 
a TV reporter went to this restaurant and asked them, would you serve gay customers? They said, of course we would. They said, would you cater a gay wedding? They said, we would not. It's against our religion. Boom. This went national. Suddenly there was a flash mob threatening to burn the restaurant down, calling for death threats on the owners. And it, it was insane. This prompted Yoram, a doctor at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, to call me. He got my number from a mutual friend and said, sir, I have to tell somebody this. My mother is elderly. She grew up in Czechoslovakia. Uh, in her early, early in her life, she spent four years in a communist prison for her Catholic faith. We're watching all this. And she said, son, the things that are happening in this country remind me of what happened when communism came to my country. Well, you're, when I heard that, I thought, that's a little bit out there. You know, my mother is old. She watches a lot of cable news. She gets excited <laughs> about the world. So right. uh, let me check around. So I called a, this couple I know in England, Ga uh, Bela and Gabby Bolabash. They're Hungarians who emigrated in the 1960s, actually defected. They didn't emigrate. They defected from Hungary. Bela was a math genius. He became a uh, mathematics don at Trinity College, Cambridge, and now he's retired. But I know them. And I said, this is what the Czech woman said. Is there anything to it? They said, oh, absolutely. We're sitting here every day in our retirement, watching the BBC, reading the papers, thinking this is just like what we, what happened when communism came to our country. I said, well, tell me what you're talking about. Well, of course, they're talking about cancel culture, about the, um, the politicization of everything in society, and not only the politicization, but the inability to speak a word of dissent without having to worry about your job, your livelihood, and your status. They said this is growing more and more and more. And in the West, people don't see it. These people who grew up with it, they saw it. And if you talk to them long enough, they'll get really angry that Americans are so complacent that they don't believe them. They think they're just being loony immigrants. So what, one of the uh, analogies that comes up uh, in the interviews is the, the comparison between you know, Antifa and social justice warriors and uh, and the Bolsheviks. And, you know, again, this this is a, a comparison. People are, you know, people are are not being, you know, mass murdered in the mm -hmm. streets. But you have something very particular in mind when you're thinking about, you know, there being kind of a, a, a vanguard that's preparing the way for something. Okay, can you Absolutely. explain what that is? Yeah, uh, and it sounds when people first hear it, it sounds really sort of crude and right wing, like, how dare you compare them to the communists. But when I got into studying the Russian Revolution, it was really striking the way certain similarities jumped out. Uh, there's a great historian, Russian American historian, Yuri Seleskin at Berkeley, who wrote a book called The House of Government, came out three years ago, A History of the Russian Revolution. And in it, he describes the Bolsheviks as a, an apocalyptic millennial political cult, which is exactly what they were. And that opened my eyes to understanding the Bolsheviks in a very different way. He says that they were essentially a religious movement, a godless religious movement, but they went about their politics. They made politics and the sort of Marxist utopia into their God. And uh, if, as he started explaining what they believed and how they believed that if we only got social factors straight. If we would control them, then we could bring about utopia. They believed, the Bolsheviks did, that if you only got rid of the bad people, in their case, the, the bourgeoisie, the exploiters, and, uh, and put the good people, i.e. the proletariat, into power, then utopia would result. And they knew that there was going to be a, there had to be a violent bloodletting called the revolution. But after that act of violence, then everything would be ship shape. Well, I mean, that's, that's kind of a crude way to put it, but that's, that's how they saw things. And they really did go at this with religious fervor. I mean, the, the Sleskin writes about how when they were sent into exile, the Bolsheviks by the czar in Siberia, you know, they used that time to deepen their own understanding of Marxism and their own commitment to the revolution. It, it's really rather impressive to read about, even though but you know what's going to eventually come of it. They're going to create hell on earth. Well, our own social justice warriors, you know, they don't have, as far as I know, any plans to, you know, for a violent bloodletting. 
But it's eerie to see how much their vision of what's wrong with society and how we fix it parallels the Bolshevik vision. They believe that if we only use the correct words, the correct language, that if we only have the correct social policies, then all the bad people, which is to say the the religious people, the whites, the males, the heterosexuals, and so on in their in their scheme. We suppress those people and we raise up the people who've been oppressed, the victim classes, then we will be in utopia. I remember reading in the New York Times Magazine last year, there was a story about transgenderism, a very long story. And they quoted without any sense of irony, a young woman of the millennial generation who works at a clinic that does uh, transgender therapies. And she said, isn't it going to be great when everybody is transgender because then we'll have better sex than anybody ever has had. You know, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's so trite compared to what the Bolsheviks are trying to do, but it's that same utopianism and that same complete rigidity, that, that dualism of there are the good and there are the bad, the line between good and evil passes between identity groups. With the Bolsheviks, it was between social classes, with the social justice warriors, it's identity groups. And if only we, we gain total control of society and suppress the evil ones and suppress their language and the things they're allowed to think, then we'll all be in utopia. There's your comparison. When we see these historical um, discussions of what was taking place uh, right before the revolution, Another parallel is uh, that you suggest is the um, is that many of the parents of these revolutionaries were actually liberals. They weren't, you know, they they, they weren't, you know, kind of benighted reactionary <coughs> uh, czarists. A lot of them were liberals, yes. uh, much like the 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 parents uh, the parents generation of uh, of today's updated Marxists or or or, right. or, or wokeists. Now, the question is that we've we've been you know batting this about for for a while in in discussions about trying to understand what's taking place. The question is, where are where are the liberals? Because, you know, it would seem that, you know, there's nowhere there there's, doesn't seem to be anywhere near a majority, you know, in America or in any other you know Western de democracy. There doesn't seem to be a majority for uh, this kind of uh, radical overthrow of every inherited concept and every inherited tradition, uh, but the but the balance seems to be held by the liberals who've been, you know, hegemonic, you know, at least since the the nineteen sixties. And the the question always is, you know, are are they willing to fight and are 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 they able to fight? Uh, what what do, what do you see happening? What do you see the liberals doing in in response? I see them capitulating at every turn. Uh, I, in the book, I talk about a key moment in American life in, in this culture war happened on the campus of Yale University in 2015. Uh, and you can see all this play out on YouTube. I encourage your viewers to go to YouTube and look at Professor Nicholas Christakis uh, confront a group of social justice warrior students. They're arguing about Halloween costumes of all the trite things. and. Uh, Christakis's wife, uh, Erica, had gotten in trouble because she said, horror of horrors, that Yale shouldn't be telling adults what kind of Halloween costumes to wear. Well, the students got angry at her and basically drove her off the campus. But there on the video is Professor Christakis trying to engage a group of students using reason. He's a baby boomer. He's a liberal, you know, a good old fashioned liberal. And he's trying to reason with this mob, but they're not having it. They're shrieking at him, they're cursing him, they're talking only about how they feel and how he's made them feel unsafe. It's a remarkable moment because it shows the collapse of liberalism in one scene. And of course, Yale University, the administrators uh, surrendered to the mob and ruled against the Christakis. This has happened over and over and over at so many uh, universities, colleges and universities. It has happened in the media. Dean Baquet, as you and I are talking, Dean Baquet, the uh, uh, editor-in-chief of the New York Times, 
has come out with a statement today defending the 1619 Project, this fraudulent exercise in wokeism that the paper foisted on the public, claiming that America was founded on slavery. It has been thoroughly criticized and debunked by historians. In the pages of the Times itself, Brett Stevens wrote uh, a definitive debunking of it. But Baquet comes out and says, no, no, we stand by this. It's important journalism. This is a man who is surrendering uh, very important values, a leader of one of the key in liberal institutions in this society, the New York Times, surrendering to wokeness, to the woke ideology. And this, we see this happening all down the line, even at the local level in high schools. So what these liberals seem to do, they've either lost confidence in old fashioned liberal values, which I think is part of it, or they're desperate thinking that if they only surrender to their kids as the liberals in uh, late imperial Russia did, that maybe they'll be spared. It's not going to happen. You're starting to see some liberals like uh, Barry Weiss, Brett Weinstein, uh, James Lindsay and others here in this country take a stand against wokeness because uh, because they value liberal democracy and they value liberal standards of free speech. But so far, it's been mostly surrender all the way to the top of these institutions. So if the surrender continues, I mean, basically what we're seeing is not all liberals, certainly not not all liberals and not at all times, but m many significant uh, institutions that used to be, uh, you can say, the, the means of producing ideas. Um, the, the, the current wokeness doesn't want to seize the means of production in terms of the <coughs> factories, but they want to seize the factories of ideas because their theory is that once you hold those those heights, once you command uh, the New York Times and Princeton University and, and, and so on, then basically the future is yours. And with that folding, that capitulation of the liberals, will we expect there to be a strong reaction from conservatives, from uh, from from the churches and from other conservative institutions, but you don't see that happening necessarily either. I mean, this is this is kind of a a, a grim landscape that we're looking at. Why, why aren't the churches fighting? Hmm. The churches are declining anyway. I mean, religious belief is declining rapidly in the United States with the millennial generation and now Generation Z. I, I read somewhere that Generation Z are is the first generation in American history in which a majority of them will have no religious affiliation. So the churches are trying to hold their own right now. And they think, as they often do, uh, le religious leaders often do, or leaders of any bureaucracy often does, is that if they just change the product, they go with the flow, then Keep, then people were not going to hate them. They're still going to want to come to church. And that's just ridiculous. It's not going to happen. You just look, you look stupid, like you don't have any faith in what you believe. In fact, Philip Reef, believe it or not, back in 1966, he talks about this in Triumph of the Therapeutic, that religious leaders um, are lying to themselves about what's actually happening in the culture. Um, so this is not anything new, but religious leaders, so many of them have thought that if uh, we can just keep up with the culture, change our religious teachings to fit it, or vote for the right person. That's a big problem on the religious right. On my tribe, we've thought that if we only get the right president in office and the right judges on the court, then everything's going to take care of itself. They forget that politics is downstream from culture. And we've been undergoing this radical cultural revolution, at least since the 60s, uh, a revolution that takes, uh, that puts at the center of, of the ultimate good, expressive individualism. The idea that I am my own God, I can do whatever I want, anything that keeps me from doing exactly what I want is an, something that has to be overcome because it's unjust. This started out in the elites, and, and this is something, by the way, that Czesław Miłosz, the great Polish dissident intellectual, warned about in his 1953 book, The Captive Mind. He said that it always starts with the elites. They're the ones who take up these ideas. And once they put them into their elite networks of running institutions, that's where these revolutionary ideas really gain ground. 
That's what happened in Russia, and that is what has happened here in the United States. The masses don't see it, and therefore, I say the masses, listen, I sound like a Bolshevik, but the ordinary <laughs> people don't see it. You know, we don't see how things like the smartphone, we don't see how the internet, things like that, work constantly to undermine the things that we conservatives at least say that we value. So we're just being sort of carried along and, and lulled into a sense of complacency and indifference. And we're seeing absolutely no leadership at all from our institutions, especially the church, I'm sorry to say, as a practicing Christian. So a landscape in which, um, in which people don't, uh, are taught from an early age in all the media, you know, in the schools and the universities and, and then at their jobs, they're, they're taught to uh, fulfill themselves, to find, to find pleasure or wh whatever gives them personally pleasure. Okay, so that sounds like um, something that I think many people will say, well, well that's what freedom is about. <laughs> Good morning, guys. That's, that's what a free society is all about. That's what we signed up for. So and Justice Kennedy said, you know, right. remember that the sweet mystery of life passes for Justice Anthony Kennedy in his 1992 ruling reaffirming the right to abortion. He said that liberty itself means the ability to define your own sense of meaning in the universe. OK, but so it, it kind of feels like uh, like checkmate. Then the kids are raised to think that uh, that liberty is this uh, you know, defining defining the meaning of the universe and reality, as Justice Kennedy said, for yourself. And you know, here comes, you know, here come uh, the, the Rod, Rod Dreher and Chazoni and these, these 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 curmudgeons, and they want to restrict our liberty. I mean, the, 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 what is it that they're the, that they're demanding? They 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 want us to knuckle under to you know to institutions, to memories, to values uh, that are handed down from the past. And you say, well, in in your book, you say, well, look, basically this society is uh, has been rigged. You could almost say to make it impossible for anyone to hand down memories to even 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 to their own children that's right because uh, the ruling ideology here in in the modern west is that expressive individualism and which tells you that anything that that teaches you that you have unchosen obligations whether to god to family to country to anything that that those are uh, balls and chains that you need to divest yourself of if you're going to be free. The problem is that this is exactly what the totalitarian governments realized too, that whoever controlled history, whoever controlled a culture's memory, controlled that culture. In the book, I tell the story about when the Nazis invaded Poland, um, it was impossible really to have much armed resistance against the Wehrmacht, but Pope John Paul, the future Pope John Paul II, Karol Wojtyla, and his friends, and all in their 20s, they were all theatrical students in Krakow. And they knew that if Poland was going to survive as a nation, it had to resist the Nazi attempt to eliminate historical memory of what the Polish nation was and the Catholic, their Catholic religion. So what they did as a form of resistance was to write plays and perform plays underground because if the Gestapo had found any of them, they would have killed them all. They performed these underground plays to keep cultural memory alive in the face of totalitarian oppression. And it turned out this was very, very important. Um, I was talking in, in, when I went to the Eastern Bloc, former Soviet Bloc nations to interview people about it. I kept hearing this again and again, that when the communists took over, they did everything they could to erase memory of the past and to put down the past, anything traditional, religion, rural life, any national traditions were condemned by the communists and the young people were hit by a constant series of propaganda films extolling the new. Because if they, if they were going to be these people, ordinary people, if they were going to be made into new Soviet men and women, they had to be uh, divested of their past. Here's something interesting though. 
a man in Budapest, Tamash Shai, I quote him in the book, he said, you know, capitalism, in the 30 years we've been free in this country, capitalism and democracy have done more to erase the cultural memory of our people than even communism did. But this was not a man who was looking forward to communism. I mean, he was, he was a capitalist, he's a Democrat, but he was talking about in terms of holding on to cultural memory and holding on to religion. Uh, and I found this to be true when I talked to young people all over the Eastern Bloc. They had no real interest by and large in the traditions of their ancestors, especially in religious tradition. All they wanted was to be good consumers like Sweden, people in Sweden. It's really, really shocking. And, and also, Yorm, I should say that they didn't have a lot of interest in what their parents and grandparents had gone through under communism because those memories were a burden to them with the kind of future they wanted to build in this brave new world. So when you look forward, I mean, I think I, I should say that your book, your book has a, a, a cross on the cover and uh, it's I, I think it's refreshing, although. You know, I'm obviously a, a Jewish and I don't identify with that symbol, but I think it's it's refreshing to see somebody uh, advancing particularity uh, and uh, their own traditions. Uh, but, but I have to say that the book is, uh, dis, dis, despite the fact that it's an overtly Christian book, and it should be, um, that it, it reads uh, in, in a way that I think I think uh, Jews and, and non-Christians can definitely uh benefit from the book uh, w without having to try too hard. I mean, I think it's it's, it's really well well executed. Um, probably your central uh, thesis in terms of going forward, and you'll, you'll correct me if I'm getting this right, is that it's going, it, it, we don't have the strength to be able to, at this moment, to pull off a, a, a reinstitution of memory at the national level and maybe maybe not even at the churches and you describe a a world that's in a, to a certain extent modeled on uh, resistant cells in eastern europe where on the one hand it's the family that is that that really is the bedrock of uh, memory and resistance and on the other hand there's an additional concept of i i, I guess you you call it like a cell uh, a, a small community, not a large community, but a small community of people who uh, who are capable of uh, cultivating memory and passing it down. Let's talk about the about the family first. Your description of the family is, uh, I would say, militant. You tell people it's it's not going to be enough to live like everybody else, but to have the right theological views. It's not going to be enough to live like everybody else and go to church once a week. Now it's going to have to be something different. The family will have to change. What is it you're proposing? I feature in this book a, a chapter devoted almost entirely to a Catholic family in Prague, the Benda family. Václav and Camilla Benda uh, raised six kids uh, during communism even as they were both deeply involved in the anti-communist resistance. They were the only Christians in Václav Havel's inner circle. And uh, they talk about the family as the, the bedrock of their resistance, even more than the church. They were, of course, devout, devout Christians, but you didn't know who you could trust in church all the time. But within their family, they were free, and they raised all of their kids not only to understand the world outside their door, understand what was wrong with the world and what their role as children growing up to be citizens of this society, what their roles would be in fighting for freedom and resisting evil, but also they poured into the hearts and minds of these children uh, knowledge of what is good, true, and beautiful. This is such an important thing because I, I think so many of us if we're involved in the culture war, we tend to be able to want to look outside the window and pick out the enemy coming, but we forget that we have to, we also fight uh, the culture war and fight for memory and for truth and for God by, poor, by teaching our children what is true. Camilla Bendova, the, the wife, the mother, I asked her what she did to help prepare the kids. She said, I read to my kids a lot. And she, by the way, was, a, was also a professor, a, a, philosopher, but she was raising that family on her own when her husband was in prison. 
uh, but she said I would read to them for at least two hours a day, no matter what was happening. I said, what would you read to them? She said, I would read to them myths. I would read to them classic literature. And I read to them a lot of Tolkien. I said, Tolkien, why Tolkien? She said, because we knew that Mordor was real. And she went on to say that we could tell the story of these, these elves and dwarves and men fighting evil. That was our story too. What was so interesting about that, Yoram, is she was telling me that she had to give those kids something good to hold on to, to know what they were fighting for. And the only place they were going to get it was there in the family, as well as different um, sessions that they would have in their apartment there in central Prague. I talked to the late Sir Roger Scruton on the last summer of, of his life last year, and he was involved in helping Václav Benda and all those dissidents uh, with their own resistance. And Sir Roger told me about how important it was to go to these seminars that people like the Bendas and other distance would have, where they would gather people who were brave enough to come out and be seen by the secret police going into their apartment. And they would just get together to talk about history or politics uh, in, a, in a theoretical sense, like Plato's Republic. And they would talk about art, all these things that helped those people remember who they were. It was family and it was small groups like that. And also as as I discovered later, small groups within the actual resistance in the underground church, because it was only in those small groups where you knew who you could trust and you were willing to take make sacrifices with people who were willing to go to jail uh, for their beliefs, just as you were. It was living those practices out, not just the ideas, but living the practices out and, give, and embodying uh, the things you believed were true, embodying them in the willingness to sacrifice your liberty and even your life, along with your comrades. That was the thing that, that gave them so much strength. Do you see uh, American families being able to do what you're proposing? I mean, you're basically saying, uh, you, I, I think you're basically taking, you know, the, the homeschool movement, you know, the, the homeschooling movement is, we, we, we have some, some relatives who live on a farm in Pennsylvania and uh, they, you know, they pulled their, their kids off, you know, off the grid, you know, in terms of the entire education uh, quite a, years ago because of this exact um, feeling that, that really you're, you're, uh, you're, you're countercultural. You're, 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 your values cannot be taught by external institutions. Now, people in America uh, today um, really don't like this homeschooling movement. I mean, it, uh, it, it, it's... Uh, it's clearly something that 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 people want to stop, and you're saying families are going to have to take responsibility for educating their their own kids. Is this possible? Yeah, it's possible right now. Thank God, uh, we have the homeschool movement has grown by leaps and bounds over the last ten years. My own kids were homeschooled, and right now they go the ones who are still in uh, in high school. They go to a hybrid school that follows a home, uh, homeschool model in the afternoons, but classroom instruction in the morning. It's a small school, a Christian school, and it's a classical school where they not only get religious instruction, but they're, they're taught uh, the classics of the Western tradition. Um, last night, my daughter, who's 14, turns 14 today as we speak, she was reading Plato's Republic at 14. And this is normal in this school. This is not a gifted and talented school, but the teachers don't assume like most American teachers in the system, the government schools assume that the kids aren't capable of doing this, but it requires real commitment on the part of parents. I think under COVID, we've seen so many uh, parents have to take their kids out of school. And I think a lot of them will have seen the advantage of homeschooling uh, as a way to guide and curate their kids' education so they the kids don't get deformed by whatever junk they're teaching in public schools. The problem with this Yoram is that it's something that you have to make a certain amount of money to do. There are people who are not rich. I mean, we're not rich in my family, but I make a, a good enough salary where we could afford to do this. Um, I think the homeschool movement has to find some way to scale this up so we're working class parents and the children of the poor can have the same advantages as those who do have homeschooling. But 
if you put your kids in public school or even a lot of private schools, even some Christian schools, they're completely woke. And my own school back home and my the little village I come from, the public school I went to, already they have same-sex couples going to middle school dances, which is to say 12 to 15 year olds. This is totally normal there. Wherever there's an internet connection, you will find this culture, this woke culture. And uh, it, you, the only way to get through it and to be a resistor and a dissident is to, um, I think, take control of your kids' schooling. That's got to be pri priority number one for all parents who wish to come through this. You write about suffering. And I, I, you know, I'm pretty sure that, that plenty of the people who are listening to you right now, that they're saying to themselves, this is going to be an awful lot of hard work. It's going to be a lot of disappointment. I mean, the kids, not all the kids, the kid, you know, teenagers are not, uh, you know, they, they can't just be be, pro, be programmed no matter what the parents want. Uh, at, you know, teenagers are, they, you know, they, they resist and they struggle their parents. And everybody's been through, the, through that knows that what the parents want is not necessarily what happens. Um, n nevertheless, uh, the parents do have a great deal of influence. But to do this requires, you said commitment, but let's add sacrifice and suffering. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is not something people people know how to do. They have to teach themselves how to do it. Uh, su suffering, we were talking uh, b before the program, uh, suffering is probably, uh, d doesn't have as central a role in Judaism you know, as, as it does in, in, in Christianity. Uh, but uh, but in in the Talmud there there you know the, there there's an expression tzal gidul banim the 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 pain the suffering of raising children, and I think the the really great question, I mean maybe the biggest question when I look at uh, at my own kids' generation, is what are they what are they willing to suffer for? What are they willing to uh, to experience pain for? Because mm -hmm. you know they they look at they look at marriage, right? And I'm not talking about just the marriages that explode. I'm talking about marriages that stay together. In in the movies, they don't you know in school they don't they don't teach you that uh, keeping a husband a, a husband and wife staying faithful to one another for for fifty years or or, or seventy five years that this involves a great deal of pain. When I speak in front of uh, adult, like older audiences, everybody starts nodding when I say mm -hmm. something like that. There's a great deal of pain in getting in a marriage, staying in a marriage, having children, staying loyal to them, and now you're adding, you're going to have to educate them. You're going to have to take primary responsibility. Can people do this now? We had better learn how to do it. That's all I know how to say. You know, I hearing you phrase the question reminds me of an anecdote I, I tell in the book. I was riding through Budapest on a tram with my translator. She was a young woman, maybe 29, 30 years old, uh, Catholic, practicing Catholic. She said that most of her friends aren't religious at all. And even those who do go to church are, you know, it's just sort of a every now and then sort of thing. She said, it's so lonely because I have nobody to talk to about the struggles I'm going through as a young mother. She had one child at home and another on the way as a young mother and as a wife who's only been married for five years. She said, whenever I try to talk to my friends about struggles my husband and I are having, the first thing they say is, well, leave him, you know, put your kid in daycare, go out and you be you, do what's right for you. And she said, I, I want to tell them, no, I, I'm happy being a wife. I want to be a wife. It's not like that. I just want to know how to bear the everyday struggles and be faithful to my husband and my kids and what God has given me to do. And uh, she was so frustrated by this. I looked at her and said, Anna, it seems to me that you are fighting for your right to be unhappy. She said, <laughs> oh, that, that's it. That's it. Where did you get that? Well, I pulled my <laughs> phone out because this is the age of the internet. And I went to chapter 17 of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, where the uh, it's a showdown between John the Savage, who lives on the outside of that dystopian society, when he meets with Mustafa Mond, who is a world controller. Now, this dystopia, the Huxleyan dystopia, is very different from the Orwellian dystopia. In Orwell's dystopia, the 
government, the state maintains its control by inflicting pain and terror on people. But in Huxley's version, the state maintains control by manipulating people's pleasures and their entertainment. And so the savage in the book comes to Mustafa Mond and Mond says, why would you not want to be part of this? You can have all the sex you want. It's, there's drugs that make you feel good. There's entertainment all the time. He calls it Christianity without tears. He said, <laughs> why don't you want to be with us? And the savage says, because I want sin. I want God. I want poetry. I want love and, and on and on and on. In other words, he's saying that I ha that to gain all these beautiful things that make us truly human, we have to be willing to suffer and to have the ability to fail and to be broken. And uh, Mustafa Mod looks at him and says, you're welcome to it. Well, uh, and, and the, the savage says, uh, I'm fighting for my right to be unhappy. Well, it made sense to this, this millennial young woman who was my translator, but she had never had it put to her that way because everything in our society, its entire ideology is built around personal fulfillment and getting rid of any anxiety, any difficulty you have. But what if suffering in that way, even whether it's in a minor way, suffering inconvenience or suffering in a serious way, like the people I talk about in this book who went to prison, who were tortured in some cases and who watched their comrades executed by the KGB. What if the key to our happiness, not just our survival, but our true joy is the ability to suffer and to bear suffering and to find meaning in it. That's what they're all saying. At the very end of my book, I talk about a young man in Bratislava, a Slovak photographer who was a toddler when communism ended. And he was raised in freedom and in relative prosperity compared to what his parents had. He's been very successful in his career, traveled all over Europe making films, but he couldn't understand why he was so unhappy until a couple of years ago, he started traveling around his country, interviewing elderly people who had been through prison under communism, who had been uh, prisoners of conscience for their political or religious dissidents. Many of them are still poor today, but they talked about how some of the happiest moments of their lives was there in prison, because that was when they were naked before God. And they knew this deep communion with God and knew what their lives meant. And that carried them. As soon as they got out of prison, it carried them through the rest of their lives. This young man, Timo Krishka, said, I had to realize that they were offering me freedom because I, I was enslaved to my own desires for success and material wealth. And uh, I, did, I, I live in a free society, but I was actually being oppressed by my own desires. So the example they gave that they took out of prison and torture actually set me free powerful story very powerful now y your book is built around this uh as a motif uh the the, the idea idea of not living out lies and it, it's taken from solzhenitsyn uh, solzhenitsyn in, in addition to his uh devout christianity and uh and and his concern for the family he was also uh a uh a well-known russian nationalist and it kind of struck me as i was you know, I was reading that um, the same kind of thing is true for, I think, quite a few of the people that you interviewed in, in Eastern Europe, I, the Hungarians and Czechs, that they they have this kind of a, um, uh, a structure that goes family, church, and nation, which, you know, I, I, I notice it, it, it reminds me very much of, of Judaism and Israel. And... Um, but I think I, I think you probably um, uh, underplay that, or you don't you 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 don't um, take up the national part. And I'm wondering whether is that because uh, you, you you find it objectionable, to the, or is it more that Americans are just you know that that you don't believe that they, that they're capable of that they want to rally around their national traditions anymore. And yeah. is there something lost if, if it's a Christianity without American nationhood? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not that I find it objectionable at all. Quite to the contrary. I think partly it's I didn't realize the full implications of what it meant that, that these nations held on to the cultural memory of themselves as a people uh, and how that gave them the strength to 
to endure Soviet totalitarianism. In fact, it was only about three months ago, long after the manuscript was in, that a Czech uh, source of mine lives here in America. He, he himself is a Catholic, but he said, you know, it wasn't even really the faith that, that held us together. It was nationhood. It was our memory of ourselves as what we were before this, the Soviets came in and imposed this alien ideology on us. And I, I'm not quite sure how I would have expressed that to Americans in, in terms of writing a book that's a how-to book. What are the lessons that we Americans can learn from these people? I found that when I've given interviews, usually somebody asks me, if I'm giving an interview to a liberal journalist, they'll ask about why I've had good things to say about Viktor Orban, for example, or uh, the Polish government. And I'll tell them that, you know, as a, as a Westerner, I had all the usual prejudices about these nationalist governments until I went there and talked to the people and came to see things through their eyes about how uh, so many of the things that we take for granted in the West, uh, multinational corporations, a lot of our institutions are actually the sort of things that dissolve a sense of particularity, dissolve a sense of nationhood, and, uh, and how the whole survival of their people depends on resisting that kind of cultural imperialism coming from the West. Uh, I'm not sure what that means in an American sense, though, because we don't have, uh, I mean, if you're in Hungary, you know very well what it means to be a Hungarian and what it means to not be a Hungarian because you're surrounded by not Hungarians all the time. If you're an Israeli, you certainly understand that. But here in America, we we don't have anybody near our borders. Most of us do, don't. Um, we are, we're the hegemonic cultural power and we don't really know what it means to lose a sense of who America is. But I think we're, and what America is. But I think we're finding out we're going to find out really soon because just this summer you've seen the statues being toppled everywhere in portland yeah. just the other day they toppled statues of abraham lincoln um i mean these are american heroes and this is not just knocking over a um a, a, a statue right this is this is iconoclastic this is destroy trying to destroy americans america's cultural memory to re invent America. That's what the New York Times with the 1619 project, when they initially published it, they said, we're going to reframe America around slavery to say that preserving chattel slavery is the foundational act of the United States, not 1776 and, and the founding of, of liberal democracy. I think that's absolutely extraordinary. And so many of us here in America today, we want so badly not to be racist, to be thoughtful and critical of our past, that we don't understand that what's happening is actually something much, much more serious than just reassessing our past. What's happening is an attempt, a revolutionary attempt to erase and demolish the foundation of what makes us a nation. Rod, we're uh, running out of time. I, I, I want to give you, um, you know, g give you some like a a softball question, but I don't know. Maybe this is maybe this is the hardest <clears throat> question. Um, what is there that um, that gives you hope that you can point to that you can uh, offer people who are are listening to you know really a very a very difficult uh, uh, time and uh, and uh, a call. I mean, you, you, it's almost Churchillian. I mean, you're basically saying, uh, I don't have anything to offer you, but, you know, blood, sweat, toil and tears. Yeah. Um, wh where's wh where's the hope? Where can you can you point us to it? You no, know, Yoram, three years ago, I was sitting at a cafe in Paris talking with the philosopher Alain Finkelkraut, and I really admired his work and we had the opportunity to meet him. And we were discussing things we have in common, the, how pessimistic we are about the survival of the West. And we were talking about how we both like the French novelist Michel Welbeck, who's very pessimistic, but we think realistic about how bourgeois hedonism will not, will not survive the threat from radical Islam or, or any other radical threat. And I, I said to him, um, where do you find hope? He said, I don't have any hope. I think this is just what's coming and we don't have any way to resist it. And I told him that, I said, sir, I agree with you that this is something terrible coming, but as a Christian, I believe that as long as we suffer uh, and keep and hold on to the faith, 
that our that God will in some sense use our suffering for the redemption of the world in a way that we may not ever live to see, but it will ultimately be used for the good. And he looked at me and said, that's very nice for you Americans, but here in Europe, we don't believe in God. There's nothing. <laughs> and I, I thought, you know, here's one of the most intelligent men in the Western world. And he's being very frank with me about how he has, he sees no hope, nothing but decline and fall. But uh, for me, uh, as a Christian, as a religious believer, I believe that God is the author of history. We know this from the Hebrew Bible and for us Christians in the New Testament. And we know that God sees and God rewards fidelity. We may not live to see it ourselves, Joram, but um, I, I think of the people I talked to for this book in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, none of them thought they would ever live to see the fall of communism. They all resisted because they believed it was the right thing to do, that it was more important to, it was important to suffer and die for the truth than to live on your knees, bowing down to something you knew was a lie. I think there's real integrity in that. As religious believers, we believe that, that God sees and God honors and God will love us and reward us for our fidelity. But uh, even if we should, should suffer and die for our faith, we will have given an example to the world of what it means to be not only a, a, a child of God, but a real man, a real woman. Um, Václav Havel said that you know, he used the example of the greengrocer. It's a fable he wrote about a greengrocer in, in living under communism who uh, has in his window a sign like every other shop does, workers of the world unite. But one day the greengrocer decides, I don't really believe this and I don't want to put it there just to avoid trouble. You know, I'm going to take it down. But when he does that, he invites into himself all kinds of persecution from the state. He may lose his business. He may lose his liberty. His kids will lose college. But what he has done is gained a moral victory. Uh, he has been able to demonstrate to the world that it is possible to live in opposition to this system if you're willing to suffer. And because he's shown that, others who are feeling inside this disgust with the lies, they will draw inspiration from it. I heard this story over and over again throughout the Soviet bloc of people who are completely demoralized under the system, seeing those who stood up against the lie and they found inspiration themselves and they found themselves through this kind of suffering. There's hope in that. Terrific. Rod Dreher, thank you for joining us on NatCon Talk. Thank you for joining us for another episode of NatCon Talk. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss us next time. Music